Hello there, very good evening. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive here at the Sky News Centre. Time to see what's making the headlines with the associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. Very good evening to you both. Thank you so much for standing by waiting for us. They'll be with us, uh, with, with us in just a few minutes' time, right up until midnight tonight. So let's have a look at what's on some of those front pages for you, starting with The Telegraph. It leads with a report that Matt Hancock mounted a rearguard action to close schools earlier in the pandemic, despite the then Education Secretary Gavin Williamson fighting to keep them open. The Guardian also leads on the former Health Secretary, writing that ministers are battling to maintain confidence in the official COVID inquiry because of those leaked messages. The Metro also leads with reaction to allegations that Matt Hancock ignored care home test advice during the pandemic. The Financial Times tomorrow reports that the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey has signalled to markets that they are wrong to assume that the bank will raise interest rates any further. And the Eye reports on bird flu and the possibility of vaccinating UK chickens to stop bird flu spreading to humans. We're off is the headline on The Sun with the report, with paper reporting on the news that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been asked to vacate Frogmore Cottage in Windsor. And the Express is also leading on that story too. Quick reminder for you that by uh, scanning the QR code uh, you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch with us. And of course, we hope you do. So let's get now to our fantastic guest tonight, the Associate Editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. Both, of course, uh, are regulars on this programme. It is great to see you again. Thank you so much for giving up your uh, Wednesday night to talk to us. Let's start then with the Daily Telegraph. Why not? Um, more bad news, it seems, for Matt Hancock and indeed others regarding uh, this story. Uh, let's start with you, Sarah. What do you make of it? Tell us more. Well, it's quite interesting. It's quite a controversial story. I mean, the, the, what The Telegraph has done, a lot of people in my industry think it's really underhand, actually, um, because, you know, these, these messages were given to Isabel Oakeshott in good faith as part of her job, which was uh, ghostwriting Matt Hancock's book. And she's decided to use them uh, to preempt the inquiry. And of course, you know, they're fascinating, of course, in their detail, but they do present a very one sided uh, picture. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think it's very responsible journalism, to be honest. Why don't you think it's responsible journalism? Well, because the inquiry will inevitably go through all of these things. Um, but what by doing it this way, what they've done is effectively preempted the whole inquiry, undermined the inquiry. I mean, their excuse is, oh, well, you know, they might not come out. But the thing is, is everything has to be seen in context. You know, and I have to say that I was I was sort of in the room on some of these conversations, not on the WhatsApp, but I was, you know, I was living with my ex-husband, Michael Gove, at the time that all these decisions were being made. And, you know, they were being made with the utmost care and attention. It's interesting that Gavin Williamson has written in The Telegraph today about the uh, question of, of, of him arguing to keep schools open. And I remember having a conversation with him in which he was desperately trying to keep schools open. But the point is, these things all need to be seen in the context. And if you just take them out of the context in which the messages were sent and you only show a part of the picture, you're not really doing your job properly, which as a journalist is to tell the truth. You're telling a part of the truth, there's no doubt about it, but you have to tell the whole, whole truth, and that's my concern. OK, Kevin, let's bring you in now. Let's pick on that in a few, a few minutes' time in terms of Sarah's last comment then, but let, let's just run through the, the kind of the allegations, shall we? This is, of course, day two of more revelations regarding these leaked WhatsApp messages that Sarah was telling us about. Um, what are they alleging in, in this case, this, uh, to the, tomorrow's paper, Kevin? Yeah, actually, in this case, Hancock comes out on the, the winning side. There is a it's December 2020. Uh, Boris Johnson is reluctant to look down again as the number of cases and deaths are going up. And there is an argument whether or not schools should remain open in December 2020. Gavin Williamson, the education secretary, saying they, they should. I remember him threatening legal action against schools if they should. But Matt Hancock is arguing, no, they will increase transmission. And when he lost the battle in December 2020, he said, look, another U-turn is in the making. And what happened? Schools 
met for a day, reopened in England for a day in the January, then they shut until March, by and large. You know, there, were, there were exceptions, for instance, you know, the children of key workers and so on. So Hancock came out on the right side. Um, so, so I, I disagree with Sarah, and I think this is in the public interest that we see all this information in real time. We're seeing the battles that were in real, real time. And we know more tonight than we did last night. And I think that's a good thing when this inquiry could take years. It could be well after the next general election before we get a full report. So, yeah, there's lots of questions around um, Isabel Oakshot releasing them. Uh, she's accused of stabbing Hancock in the back by revealing them after she was given them for, for a book which she put her name to as well as Hancock and she said in the in the book it was telling the truth. Well, it's certainly not telling the whole truth we can see that now. And yes, she signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, a gagging order. But I'm personally pleased she's she she's broken that because I think we do get more information. And you can ask Hancock what was he doing given all these WhatsApp messages, more than 100,000, some with Boris Johnson, some with Rishi Sunak. We're going to hopefully get a lot of this from the Telegraph, which handled the expenses scandal brilliantly when it um, used checkbook journalism to buy a disc and information back in, uh, in, in 2009. They've had a team on this for two months. So all this week certainly will get bits. Um, yeah, you can say, what was he doing giving all this information to a journalist who was an outspoken critic of lockdowns, somebody who would have, was on the wrong or the different, uh, the opposite side of the argument to him. So, yeah, his judgment is certainly flawed there. And the book that was intended to relaunch his career, sold 4,000 copies, the pandemic diaries, that was all, is probably going to sink it because people aren't going to be laughing at him now when he goes on reality shows after they know, for instance, the row over care homes, which he disputes nevertheless. But I, I do think, yep, journalistic uh, ethics, I, I get that. And Isabel Oakshaw has, has to answer questions. But I think we, as the public, know more now than we did before, and that's got to be a good thing. Um, I actually have to say, before we move on any further, we have heard from, uh, or a spokesperson, I should say, from Matt Han Hancock, saying tonight's revelations, well, these are the revelation, revelations in tomorrow's paper, are exactly like last night's. These are partial accounts. They're obviously spun with an agenda. They show Matt was focused throughout on saving lives, the right places for a full assessment in the inquiry. We've also heard from Sir Gavin Williams, and he, of course, was the then Education Secretary. Apparently, he accused teachers of looking for an excuse not to work during the COVID pandemic. That's further down into the uh, article, it seems. He has tweeted saying, further to reports in The Telegraph and other outlets, I wish to clarify that these messages are about some unions and not teachers. I was responding regarding unions. I have the utmost respect for teachers who work tirelessly to support students. Um, we'll leave that yeah, there. Right. And <laughs> let's, let's just get your, um, your opinion, Sarah, on uh, the Metro. I mean, they've taken this story, but they're focusing on today's angle, saying they're sickened by Hancock's messages Grieving families reacted angrily to claims that Matt Hancock overruled experts' advice to give a COVID test to anyone entering care homes at the start of their pandemic. What do you make of their position? Well, again, I think you need to see it in the context of the time. At the time, there weren't enough tests. Um, they simply didn't have enough tests. I mean, there was a massive shortage. And they were, you know, they were they were trying to make decisions almost completely in the dark. You can um, see how gre a grieving family reading this would just be sickened, would be infuriated by this. Yes, but then on the other hand, you see, I think they would need to see the full picture. And this is, this is my problem, is I don't think we're getting the full picture here. And I think it's cruel on the families of people who died to give them glimpses of the process. I think the whole process needs to be seen um, because... You know, this is this is what the, what the, what the Telegraph are doing is is politicising this awful situation, and they are using it to sell newspapers. And I have to say, I disagree with um, Kevin. I love you, Kevin, but I disagree with you on the expenses thing because I was involved in that, and the Telegraph told things, said things about me and my husband at the time that were just simply inaccurate. Despite the fact that they had the correct information, they simply didn't want, they ignored it because it didn't suit their agenda. And I think this is really important here because newspapers have a responsibility. You know, we, you know, we have to safeguard our, our free speech. It's a very important thing. We mustn't abuse it. And I'm not sure that this doesn't 
edge into that area. That's my concern. And I, I think it must be awful if you lost somebody in the pandemic to be made to feel that it was a deliberate attempt by a health secretary to kill your relative. Of course it wasn't. Of course that wasn't what happened. That's an absurd suggestion. And that's what we're, that's what's happening here. And that's what releasing these messages without any context or attempt really to put the other side is doing. It's but Sarah, and I, and I, I agree, look, I don't, I don't think anybody intended to intentionally kill anybody, but some people may have unintentionally died because of decisions. But I think it's quite demonstrably true now that the health secretary did not put a protective ring around care homes. We can see that. And when he would say he was um, following the signs, he wasn't always doing that. Political decisions were made, and I accept they're made in they're made in real time in difficult circumstances and the the, the pandemic has started of course there's not enough ppe matt honkak did say there were no shortages which was i think was also incorrect as just so many people working in the health service and elsewhere would would testify and he tried to sell a certain story and you, you you're quite right we've got to be wary of how the telegraph which has increasingly been moving into a lockdown skeptic position as a paper and looking back becoming far and far more critical but hancock with isabel oakshot who is now accused of stabbing him in the back produced his own very partial diaries the pandemic diaries to give his very partial partisan view. And so, Kevin, just briefly, because I want to have... He started it. I just want to have a quick look at The Guardian before we go to our break. That They take an interesting angle, actually, in tomorrow's front page. Confidence in COVID inquiry is hit after the leak of Hancock messages. Of course, Rishi Sunak today defending the uh, official inquiry as the right way to go. But do you think question marks now hang, how now hang over this inquiry? Yeah, if, in fact, the leak may make the inquiry better in the, in the sense that it could speed it, uh, it could speed it up. I think that is the problem. It was really set up not to report before the general election. That was the idea when Boris Johnson was in power, when he was prime minister, when he was in Downing Street, because uh, of Partygate, not because of just because of his decisions at the time, but because he was very compromised by uh, breaking COVID rules. And of course, he got that. He got that fine. But yeah, confidence in the inquiry is dead. But I think I think it'd be one back that that uh, my Hancock says he's given all the evidence to the inquiry. If I was them, I would be checking the uh, WhatsApp messages they got against the telegraphs just okay. to make sure it's, it's going to be out. A, it's going to be a big story tomorrow. We've got plenty more papers to get through. Sarah and Kevin, for now, thank you very much. More reaction to the news that uh, Harry and Meghan have been asked to leave Frogmore Cottage is coming up after this short break. See you in a moment. Hi there, welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview. Back with me now is the Associate Editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin Maguire. We're also joined tonight by the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. Welcome back to you both. Again, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, let's have a look at some of the other papers making uh, headlines uh, tomorrow morning. And the I newspaper says UK chickens may be, get, may be given jabs to stop bird flu spread in humans, the government considers vaccinating UK poultry flocks against bird flu to fight the worst ever global outbreak and prevent future pandemic in humans. Uh, we've finished with Kevin. So, Sarah, let's start with you. What do you make of this front page? It seems like a perfectly sensible idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, we inject humans against flu. Why not inject chickens? I, you know, I don't really know what to say. It's not, it's not really a very interesting splash. <laughs> well, it would be a monumental task, wouldn't it? I mean, I mean we know that the bird, there, are bird flu... lot, there are a lot of chickens. You're right. It would be quite a lot of chickens. I mean, yes. I suppose the fact that it, it's causing absolute carnage isn't the poultry industry, but of course, Kevin, on a much more serious note as well, you know, the, the risk of, it, of transmitting between mammals and, of course, the risk to humans. And we know what's happened to that girl in Cambodia. I mean, the threat potentially is real, isn't it? Yeah, it may be small, but if it's it's real, just deal with it. Although I can imagine me a hell of a flap trying to uh, uh, inject uh, what millions and millions of birds. Uh, you know, perhaps the uh, you know it, it can go. I think there's some evidence it can go from 
you know, flocks uh, that are kept on farms into, into into other wildlife, and then to jump into people that that is worrying. So now, it does just seem sensible, but is it feasible? That's that's what I wonder. Is it is it actually physically possible, and is it economically viable? Yeah, good question. Yeah. Onto the front page of. Uh, oh, did you want to come in, Sarah? Well, I was just going to say is maybe if we kept our chickens slightly better and didn't treat them quite so appallingly. <laughs> yeah. Fair sort of point. Free range is the way forward, isn't it? Onto the front page of the Daily Mail. Um, and a really powerful story, actually, from uh, Carrie Johnson. Uh, Carrie says, mm. keep killer pilot behind bars. Uh, Sarah, tell us more. This is a horrible story. This man uh, killed his estranged wife with a claw hammer in front of their... Well, not in front of the... In the same house as, as their two small children. Um, having Having dug her grave uh, in, a, in in Windsor Great Park, actually, and uh, and sort of, you know, equipped himself with a plastic box to put her body in. And for some reason, he was only convicted of manslaughter, which just seems extraordinary. Anyway, he's done 13 years, and the suggestion is, is that he could be out on parole. And Carrie Johnson, who um, some people may not remember or know, was instrumental in keeping... Uh, War Boys, who was the black cab rapist who is thought to have attacked, you know, upwards of 100 women, um, keeping him behind bars um, by giving testimony. So she's taken up this cause, um, which I think is a is a very good one, because quite honestly, 13 years for beating your wife to death with a claw hammer is an insult. It's not justice in any shape or form. Yeah, Kevin, what do you make of her intervention? Obviously, she's very high profile, isn't she, in this country? And many people may not realise her own backstory, her own personal backstory to this. No, that's right. As Sarah mentioned there, John Warboys, the black cab rapist, because when she was 19, she was drug buying uh, and uh, clearly had an effect on her. Um, and John Warboys could have been released early uh, if she and others hadn't forced the Justice Secretary to intervene. I think she's she's right on this, and a lot of women are, many men too, and to cross party in Westminster, the, this guy, Robert Brown, it, it was manslaughter with diminished responsibility. So he served 13 of a 26 year sentence, but it, given, given the barbarity and the savageness of the the murder, it just it just doesn't feel like justice. I, I agree, you know, his, uh, his dead uh, former wife, um, Jo um, is it Joanna? Joanna's uh, mother was uh, at the meeting in Westminster too, and it it, it, it just beggars belief. Now I, I, I believe in rehabilitation and redemption, and sometimes think the wrong people are in prison when they have problems with literacy and alcohol and other problems. But there are some serious people who commit okay. terrible crimes who should be behind bars, including this guy. Quick look before we go on the front of the uh, Sun newspaper. Eviction notice that says, Dear tenants, Harry and Meghan, you're hereby given an eviction notice to vacate Frogmore Cottage <laughs> immediately after one's coronation in May. The headline reading, We're off. I hope I said that properly. Sarah, we've got about... We've got about... We've got about... Ten, well, actually, we haven't even got 10 seconds to talk to you. I'll tell you what, we're going to talk it's, about it. It's the tiniest violin. It's the tiniest <laughs> violin ever. The tiniest violin, Sarah says. We are going to talk about it in the 11 o'clock. You don't go anywhere, and we'll talk about that properly shortly. Thank you for now.